Hello, my name's Kate Costello and I come from a company called Governance Matters and it's terrific to be able to be with you today to talk about good governance for your organisation. Just before we get started, I wanted to tell you a story and you'll think that it has nothing to do with governance, but it does have and I'll explain later. Um, my background's in law and some years ago I came back to my office. Someone had sent me an article which was about or purported to tell you what personalities were like in a room according to where people chose to sit if the room was set up as a U-shape and you were the facilitator. And because I did a lot of work as a facilitator, I was interested in it. What the research said is that the person who sits second to your right is out to get you in a major way. They're the classic devil's advocate. They want to disagree with what you say. They want to prove they know better. And they said the people on the right, a bit like that, but not as much as the second person in. Then the research said the person who sits first to your left is the teacher's pet. That's the individual who sort of smiles at you all the time. Even if you were dreadful, they'd still say you were great, chat to you, at, you know, when you took a break. And again, the people on the left, a bit like that, but not so much as the teacher's pet. If it's a U-shape, you'll of course have people sitting opposite you. And they called these people in, in the research the barons. And they said the barons tend to be slightly elder statesmen. Um, they often sit with, sit with their arms folded and, you know, if they're men, they've got greying hair or women with greying hair. Um, they're the most objective. So apparently their attitude resides somewhere between the right and the left. And they say, we reserve judgment. We'll wait and see. If they do a good job, we'll say so. If not, we'll also say so. Now you think, how strange. I'll tell you what that has to do with governance. I do a lot of work in board evaluations and sometimes I sit in on board meetings having signed a confidentiality agreement to watch what happens. And what I've found amazingly, sort of eight times out of ten, or there are always some exceptions, is that where directors sit in the same position at every board meeting relative to the chairman, what I've just told you is so often right. The person who sits second to the right of the chairman, sorry if that's where you're sitting now, but uh, they'll often be the sort of devil's advocate, the one who's prepared to, you know, debate things with the chairman. And the person who sits first to the left, often the CEO, quite a good thing because you need a good relationship between the chairman and the CEO, but those two will tend to get on well. And what's the point of that story? The point of the story is don't let directors sit in the same position at every board meeting. If you've got someone who takes the minutes, a good thing to do is to have a place name for each board member and to put those around at random. What this tends to do is keep the board dynamic and that's particularly important if the board's really going to be functioning at a strategic level. It can be threatening to people, particularly when they're very used to sitting in the same position. It can break up factions, but it is a good thing to do. What are we going to have a look at today? We're going to have a look at three main points. We're going to look at understanding the role of the board and we're going to have a look at getting the right skills on the board and encouraging the right behaviour between board members. Finally, we're going to have a look at introducing very effective governance processes. Understanding the role of the board, it seems like I might be insulting you because you think, yeah, 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 I understand the role of the board. But the point about it is that many board members have come from a background where they've been in management and then they're elevated to a board and they tend to assume that the board's role is to second guess management, to be a check on everything that management is doing. That's not the role of the board. But the board does have to ask itself the question, how do we as board members add value to this organisation rather than just being a cost centre? You are a cost centre because managers have to spend a lot of time preparing board papers, getting papers to you, answering queries, spending time in board meetings. Even if you're in an honorary position and not paid any director's fees or board member fees, there are still costs. So you want to make sure that the time you spend together as a board is really good time and that the role you play and the contribution you make is somewhat different from that of those in management. I think the very best definition I've ever heard really is by a guy called John Carver. Um, who writes extensively in governance, he defines really the role of the board as this. The board's role is to create the future of the organisation, not just mind the shop.
and I see a lot of boards where most of the effort is spent on what's already happened and what's happening now without any genuine attempt to look at what do we want the organisation to look like in 10 years time or so. So you're not there to warm the seat, you're there really to say, yeah, let's get today right, but let's make sure we're taking the organisation into a very successful future. In fact, too, I should say, some of you would be aware of the, of the writings of a guy called Don Watson, and he wrote a book called Weasel Words. I find it amusing to think that the term governance is in his book, Weasel Words, and that's because it is a bit of a weasel word. You hear it all the time. Governance this and governance that, and governance and governments are talking about governance, and NGOs talk about gov governance. And actually, therefore, it confuses people. It's not that confusing. In many respects, in your circumstances, it means, what is the board doing to add value to the organisation as opposed to what is it that management is doing? And the best starting point to get an understanding of this is a diagram called the Tricker model, because it was developed by a man called Robert Tricker, who was one of the first academics and consultants looking at governance as a field of learning in the 80s as opposed to, you know, just some ethereal thing. And Tricker developed this model. The model is interesting. It's not perfect, but it's certainly, it's, it's a good starting point for understanding the role. And if I was with you, I'd stop talking for a minute and just give you a chance to have a look at that model yourself. But because we can't interact in the way we'd be able to if I was with you, I'm going to explain some things about the model to you. So, you'll notice some things. First of all, you'll notice that some of the functions of the board relate to the past and the present. They're the left-hand functions, accountability and monitoring and supervision, and we call those the compliance or conformance functions of the board. And you often hear about that, don't you? The board's, you know, compliance, compliance, compliance. But equally, you'll see that the board has to worry about stuff that's on the right-hand side. And these are, the, these are the areas or the functions that relate to the future. And we call these functions, strategy and policy, we call these functions the performance functions of the board. You'll also notice that some of the things the board has to do will translate the organisation to the external environment. They're the top functions accountability and strategy. And then some of the things that the board has to worry about are happening inside the organisation to achieve what it wants to achieve. So there, that's monitoring and supervision and policy making, the bottom section. Central to all of this is the word CEO, or in your case it might be general manager, or whoever the senior manager is, the board's role is to, to be crass, hire and fire, and performance manage the person who occupies that position. Now that all sounds terribly boring. A lot of boards spend a hell of a lot of time on the left hand side. More about that in a minute, but perhaps not enough time on the right hand side. When I ask boards when I'm with them, tell me which quadrant you spend most of your time in, most of them will say bottom left. Monitoring and supervision, most of them will say this. If it might be sort of a board related to government, they, they might say top left accountability because they're very worried about accountability to the minister or the shareholder, shareholding minister. But look, I tell you, 80% of boards will say we spend most of our time in the bottom left monitoring and supervision. You say, what do you do that for? Why? If you say why, they'll say, well, because we've got too many accountants on the board or too many lawyers on the board. In other words, they'll talk about the skill set of the individuals who sit around the table. And if you've had a particular training, like my original training in law, it can overly develop some aspect of the brain, you know, that means you want to cross T's and dot I's a bit more. Good skills, but you need to balance it with the other side. Another reason why boards spend a lot of time in the bottom left is because of the way they order the agenda for board meetings. But I'll tell you more about that in a second. But most boards think you have to run an agenda in a particular way, and you don't. You don't. You can do it however you want. But I will explain what good boards do in a moment. 
A third reason why boards love the bottom left is because it's safe. It's safe. It's certain, it's concrete, because it relates to the past and present. You know what's happened. You get the financials, you can look at expenditure against budget. You know, it, it's concrete, so it's nice. A lot of people will tell you that with boards, you know, one stage I was on the board of the South Australian Totalisator Agency Board, and I know that we used to spend an inordinate amount of time on issues such as the colour of the carpet that was going to be put in, you know, some TAB outlet somewhere. You know, because you're human being, you tend human beings, you tend to really grip onto the things that you understand. Whereas, if you think about it, particularly the top right quadrant, strategy, true strategy, a bit frightening, because you could make some mistakes. You might get things wrong. And when you see actions against board members for damages, for example, for breach of duties or breach of the duty of care and diligence, which is actually the subject of another DVD, um, people get nervous, they get so nervous and they tend to f push themselves back into the left. So there are all sorts of reasons why time is spent, um, I think, in the bottom left. One other thing I want to tell you about this model. If the world was perfect in governance, which it never is, if the world was static and whatever, you would start somewhere in this model. You would start in the top left quadrant. You would start with accountability. And as we go on, that's what I'm going to explain to you. So I'm going to go into each of these quadrants in more detail as we go through. But the arrows would work like this. You would start in accountability and get that right. When you got that right, you'd move to strategy and you'd get that right. Once you'd developed that biggest strategy, you'd move to bottom right. You'd put the internal rules in place to deliver it. And then you could move to bottom left and monitor and supervise that all of this was happening. However, life's not quite like that, I know. So, you know, you'd be spending different amounts of time in different quadrants depending on things like if you've got a really clear strategic direction, really clear, and you're in a sector that's not changing that much, the external environment, why would you be spending all your time in the top right? You've sort of done that. But if you were going broke, you know, worried about your finances, highly likely you're going to be in the bottom left a lot, biting your nails, and some would say you should be in the top right. You know, if you're going broke, your strategy's not working, but it's pretty gutsy to do that. So I know the world isn't perfect, but I hope you agree that that model, just as a diagram, is a little bit helpful. Now I'd like to spend a bit of time in each of these quadrants for you. So let's have a look now at the top left-hand quadrant of Tricker, accountability in more detail. And the board and the organisation have to worry about the entities or the groups to whom the organisation is accountable. And unfortunately, there are some of those groups where you can't say, no, we don't want to do what you want us to do. And some examples of that are the law and regulation. So for example, you can't say, don't like occupational health and safety law, so we're not going to worry about that. Or not crazy about trade practices, so let's not comply with one of the sections there. Yeah, have to. And usually the way the board ensures that's happening is by endorsing policy that relates to compliance with laws. There's something else you can't say no to, your constituent document, which means your rules or your constitution. And if you're a statutory authority, for example, you'll have your own Act of Parliament and that legislation will stipulate how you do things. What amazes me in many sectors is how often boards are ignoring what their constituent document says, what their constitutional rules say. So, for example, they might specify that something needs to be done in a particular way, you know, 28 days notice before a general meeting, and, and they're just not doing that in the way. Now, that's okay as long as something doesn't go wrong, but I can tell you one of the primary indicators of a director's breach of care and diligence is not following your own constituent document. And when I say constituent document, that means the document that created you. You have to know what it says. If you don't like it, you have to change it. Creditors. Be nice to be able to say no to creditors, but we can't. Might be banks. 
or it might be your suppliers. So you undertake to pay people in a certain period of time and you need to, otherwise you're in danger of trading insolvent, which would mean potentially personal liability for you as directors. Um, other contractors as well, you know, government funding, any of you who receive government funding know all the paperwork that has to occur to, to answer for that funding. And sponsors, you know, will sponsor you on the basis of an agreement that they get certain coverage for that. Well, you have to honour those agreements. But there are some groups to whom the organisation and the board is accountable that you need to listen to, but they can't always have what they want all the time. You don't absolutely have to do exactly what they want. And examples there, the owners, whether the owners are shareholders or members or the government, customers, staff, and generally the wider community. These are the groups that create some difficulty for the board because what the board has to do is listen to these groups, but it won't always be able to deliver to each of these groups exactly what that group wants. Some examples of good governance practices in the top left-hand quadrant of Tricker relate to the board instigating high-level ways of listening to major stakeholders. You know, I see boards that spend a lot of time on their financial key performance indicators, but they never, ever, ever really measure appropriate non financial measures and sometimes those measures will come from having listened to your major stakeholders well enough, customers, staff, members and the board needs to consider how it's going to track those numbers because they are the leading indicators I think of future financial or efficiency performance. Also, the board's got to worry these days a lot, everyone talks about risk, 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 risk. So you've got a, a risk management framework, whatever. But I just want to tell you something about risk. Interestingly, you might remember there was an Australian insurance company called HIH and it collapsed. And in the collapse, or following the collapse, there was a Royal Commission. And the Royal Commissioner was a man called Neville Owen, Owens. And he actually said as part of his findings, really, that the best risk mitigator any organisation can have is not policies or processes, not stuff that's written, the best risk mitigator is your culture. And not a lot of boards spend too long thinking about the culture of the organisation and how they might infuse a positive culture. So let's have a look now at the quadrant I like best of all, really, strategy, and the top right quadrant having moved from accountability. I think often people are confused in a way about what strategy formulation means. There's a sense, some people are critical of that terminology because they think it's saying the board must formulate the strategy itself, whereas of course in reality mostly a lot of the strategic thinking um, for discussion and planning comes from management. The tricker model is not saying the board has to physically do all of these things itself. What it will be relying on, of course, will be management to do a lot of these things, but then to bring it to the board for approval and for input. So that's in a way what strategy is about. It's saying, um, it, well, it's saying, what sort of organisation do we want to look at, want to look like at some future point in time? And, you know, because I've got a legal background, I'm self-taught where strategy is concerned and I found the work of Michael Porter from Harvard most useful for me. And if I was to, in a crass way, summarise what he said in his article, What is Strategy? This was really helpful to me as a, as a board member. Michael Porter says, strategy is not operational effectiveness. It's important to think about that. In other words, you can get a whole lot better at what you're doing, but what you're doing might be going down the gurgler. So he actually says strategy requires you to answer some very, very hard questions about how you want to position yourself, how you're going to be different from those with whom you might compete, and <clears throat> what it is you're going to concentrate on to take you to the future that you think will be a successful one. Porter also says, and this was particularly helpful to me, he says, you're not being strategic unless you can define what you don't do as much as you define what you do do. You can't be all things to all people.
I think strategy two is also about really what I would call the gut, the head, and often what's forgotten, the heart. So just a bit of the gut feeling that the board has that this might be a good thing to look at or pursue or discuss, but dangerous if you don't do some sort of decent market research to see if what you feel is right is right. And so you have to exert some head. You've got to really look at uh, market research to see that your supposition of what you think will work is true and the market wants it. No one ever talks about the heart. And I could talk forever about that, but mm, often strategic plans that are approved by boards are, the, are boring, boring, shockingly boring documents. You know, where every organisation expresses their vision and mission in the same way and people yawn and vomit because it's exactly the same as the one from the company next door. And that's because actually the wording lacks heart and it's very important that you make it just right for your organisation. It's hard to do that as Don Watson recognised in Weasel Words because it's trained out of us. We're trained to write in very awful language. So try very hard to put some heart into strategy documents. A final point on strategy here is you've got to answer the hard questions. When I facilitate strategic planning stuff with boards and senior executive teams, what I notice more than anything else is they want to avoid the highest level hard questions. Now those questions for you might be, should we move into state? Or should we discontinue that particular offering because it's not serving our purposes anymore? Or to what degree should we have this particular product or service um, cross-fertilising a financial input to another product or service? These are the big questions and if you're not prepared to answer them, you might as well shut up shopping because you're not being strategic. So what are some examples of what good boards do in strategy? Well, they're prepared to put their money where their mouth is and they do develop longer term strategic plans. So they're prepared to say this is what we want to look like 10 years out. Now that's got to be reviewed all the time because the world can change. But to have a picture about what you would like to look, at, look like is very important. But can you notice that in the PowerPoints it says with measures, with measures, the one thing most boards fail at is they actually don't develop the KPIs, key performance indicators, that will measure achievement of that strategic direction long term. Hard to do, but most important. The reason you've got to have that is because then your shorter term plans, business plans, budgets, you know, operational plans with their own short term measures, has to align with that strategic direction because then your budget has to align with all of that. Now I know that seems basic, but so often I will see an organisation that say in the May of a year, if their financial year is 1 July 30 June, in the May of a year will approve a business plan for the next year, or not a budget, a budget, which is loosely based on the budget from the year before. Then in June they approve a business plan and in September the board goes away and starts doing strategically. It's completely the wrong way around. So you have to start with the end in sight and work backwards. Another th thing that good boards do in strategy is they really do dedicate some meetings just to strategy. Just, 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 just to strategy. Not to the compliance side of Tricker. Literally to rolling up the sleeves and saying, here's a big topic, let's just talk about it along with management. It might be that management's prepared some papers or it might even be that a board member's you know, fanatical about a particular topic and wants to put something up to the board. But you've got to just talk strategy in some dedicated time. Some boards spend the first hour of a board meeting on a rolling theme of strategic issues. And the most important thing that boards do, good boards, is that they do reorganise their agenda. You know, so if you've got an agenda that runs like this, open the meeting, apologies, minutes of the previous meeting, business arising, GM or CEO report, finance report, somebody else's report, somebody else's report, somebody, then, you know, recommendation to do this huge thing that's going to cost a lot of money. Now what happens there is the board's energy is wasted on all compliance stuff, the past and the present, before it gets to the important stuff. 
So what good boards do is they reorganise that agenda and they make sure that the sequence they follow is a sequence of let's start with the big things we have to take a decision on. Then let's move to the big things we want to have a discussion on. Then let's put all that stuff for noting or information like the reports right at the end and, and take them as read. Uh, and that tends to work really well, very well. Some managers tell me, they're cross to hear me say that because they actually organise the agenda in the formal way so that they can slip the big issues to the end and have the board agree because board members want to get out of the meeting after a few hours and catch a plane or... So maybe it's done deliberately, not saying it is for your board, but in some boards that's certainly the case. Let's have a look at the bottom right hand quadrant, policy. And the funny thing about this one is it took me forever to really, really understand from a board's perspective what this meant. Um, you know, I'd been working in the area for some time when literally a sort of ding went in my head and I got it. So I'm hoping I can explain it to you so that you understand, I'm sure you do understand well already, but just in the way I mean it, for good governance. There's a quote here from John Carver, which is effectively saying that virtually everyone in a company makes policy, and they do. You know, if you think about someone at a front line facing a customer or dealing with a member, or um, then you'll see that the way they behave uh, impacts the impression of the organisation they give, and in a way they're sort of making an on-the-run policy decision there. The really important thing about this quote from Carver is that he says, the board must make its policies at the highest level and decide how detailed a policy needs to be before the board says, this is what we endorse and now we hand it to management to work out how to make this work in an operational sense. The best way though for the board to sort of create the rules by which the organisation has to function is by endorsing high level policy for how the organisation functions. Carver also says that the board should pretend it's only got one employee. Even if you've got 300 or two, or it doesn't matter. If you've got lots and lots, Carver says really, the board should pretend that it only has the CEO or the general manager or the head or whatever, and in a way do everything through that individual. So that if you have board members who are running around going to staff and telling them what to do, this is completely unfair to the senior manager because the board will measure the performance of the senior manager according to whether they achieve objectives that have been agreed. And if you've got board members telling staff what to do, then you're undermining the role of the senior manager, CEO or by whatever name, and this is very unfair. So, often good boards will have a protocol about the manner in which individual board members are allowed to contact staff. Now, in an open organisation, you want everyone to... And most good general managers would say, that's fine, you know, but don't tell them what to do. And don't take up an inordinate amount of their time if they're working on things at an operational level. Here are some things that good boards are doing in policy. Hmm. The kindest thing you can do, the kindest, kindest thing you can do to the senior manager is to develop something called a matters reserved for the board policy. Sounds like a fancy term, but really what it means is developing a clear, unambiguous list of the areas where only the board can take a decision, where therefore the senior management manager must bring a recommendation to the board and the board has to approve it before it can be put into, uh, into place in an operational sense. But you'll say, ah, uh, you'll be thinking, we've already got a delegations policy. But a delegations policy is not quite, a, well, not quite what I mean. You know, often there'll be a financial delegations, or there might be a delegations policy to, to the CEO or general manager that goes further than delegations, but it'll have phrases in it like, material contracts must become, must come to the board. Important legal issues must come. Now, the minute you have a word like material or important and you don't define it, that leaves everybody a bit confused about how important does it have to be. 
what does materiality mean before only the board can take a decision on it. So the very good boards develop a policy, as I said, called Matters Reserved for the Board, and it runs like this. Here is a list of the things that only the board can take a final decision on. Number one, strategic plan. Number two, annual plan. Number three, annual budget. Number four, mergers or acquisitions. Number five, appointment of auditors because it's got to be recommended to the general meeting. Six, seven, eight, nine, a complete list. And when you get to the end, you can't say, and other really important things because then it's ambiguous. And you know what, if you have that discussion around your board table and with the CEO or senior manager, you will find that there'll be dispute, but by the time you finish it, there will be for your organisation a clear dividing line between what constitutes governance at that point in time and what constitutes operations or management. Because if it's not on the list, the senior manager might tell you what they're doing as they do in their report to you. So we're not talking about you won't get information on it, you'll get information, but actually the CEO doesn't have to bring that to the board for final approval because it's not on that list. And the list is can be reviewed, that's fine. Okay, another good thing that boards do is they separate their policy decisions from the minutes of board meetings and they centralise those in something like a board manual. And the reason they do that is so they can be reviewed and changed if necessary, but also policy decisions recorded in minutes are forgotten. And if you're a new board member too and you weren't part of that decision, how are you to know what the policy framework is the board's put in place, um, which, which describes how management is to operate the company? So just to give you an example, every time a board, say in a meeting, would take a decision, from now on we should do this. This is the way we should do something from now on. Actually, they've made a policy decision. And if you leave that just recorded in the minutes, who's going to remember that? So you have to go through and think, what are the policies that we have endorsed as a board? And let's get them into a document, a manual, or online, so they're easily accessed and can be reviewed to update where necessary. Bottom left of Tricker, monitoring and supervision. Can you see now, I hope you can see, that if you have attended to your accountabilities and you've really looked at your strategy and you've got some good measures and you've endorsed policies that you can find, then it becomes possible as a board to monitor and supervise what's happening at operational level, at management level, in a governance sense, not an operational sense. Because what you're actually checking is that the organisation is achieving its strategic key performance indicators, that it's actually meeting its annual objectives or KPIs, that management's complying with the policies the board has endorsed, very important, you can see now you've got a role in checking what's happening at operational level, not like a second tier of management, but in a slightly different way. A final thing the board needs to do here is to have a discussion with the CEO or general manager about the style, the type and style of information it wants to get by way of reports. So often you become a board member and the reporting has been done this way for some time. Have a discussion, say, do we like the information we're getting in the finance reports? And would we change what it looks like to make it more useful for us? Are we getting too much? Are we getting too little? Have a discussion and work out what information you want to get from management to help you to understand what's happening within the organisation and monitor what's happening. Do you remember that central to the model, the Tricker model, was the role of the CEO and the fact really that the board is there to, as I said crassly, hire and fire the chief executive. Um, so the board has a very real role in remunerating and rewarding um, and agreeing employment contracts, etc. Mostly what I find is boards don't do a great job at establishing a performance management system for the CEO. 
It's particularly true in certain sectors where the CEO has great power and the board members maybe less so. Um, and the board sometimes doesn't even feel comfortable in discussing with the CEO what performance objectives might apply on an annual or longer term basis and what measures will be put in place to measure that performance. Um, in addition to doing that, it's really important for the board once a year at least to have a, a discussion about succession planning for the position of CEO. And that is because anything can happen, as you know, the proverbial fall under a bus, but it can happen. So I think a good board schedules a time to talk about if X disappears from the company tomorrow, who would take over that position short term the next day? Who might be suitable for that medium term? And do we have to go to the external market to find someone longer term? This is a discussion where a plan should be put in place for that eventuality, even though you're often hoping that that's not the case. So do you remember, right back at the beginning, I said the very first thing for a board is to understand its role? I'm hoping that you have a bit of a more enhanced understanding of your role as a board now. And I then said we're going to have a look at the fact that boards need to get the right skills on the board. And this is a bit contentious, this one, but I have to tell you what I think. So, for example, there's some evidence, though not conclusive, that the size of a board makes a difference. Once upon a time, you used to see boards of 35. Sometimes in some organisations, there will still be a board or council of 35 people. Now, the evidence is it's pretty hard to really pull that group together in a cohesive way. The tendency these days is for smaller boards. I think the average board size in Australia across all sectors is about eight or nine now. And in fact, there is some evidence that you get the best decisions out of groups of about five to seven people. So the size of the board you would want to talk about. Also the board skill set. You know, what are the skills that you need on this board given where the organisation's headed? This can be a very hard discussion because it might be that particularly where board members are elected that you just end up with whatever skill set you end up with and it may not be the skill set that's right. Um, so to have a discussion about, maybe with a blank sheet of paper, if we really thought about the real skills we need what would they be? And they're not just financial and legal. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Much more sophisticated than that too. To have a discussion about that and then to orchestrate the getting of those skills, whether it is by some directors or board members retiring or resigning before their term is up so that the board gets to fill a casual vacancy before this director or board member has to seek election at the next AGM. Mostly boards assist what you might call the democratic process by doing that and that's something that, that you can consider too. Committees in terms of structures, uh, boards tend to have the same old, same old, same old committees. So everybody thinks these days you've got to have an audit and finance committee. Now why do we think that? We think that because of some of the major corporate collapses in the 80s and 90s, particularly the likes, say, of an Enron, that big American or international company um, that went into liquidation, losing billions and billions of dollars. Um, and you know, there's this notion that you've got to have an audit committee. The amusing thing about Enron is they actually had an audit committee comprised of some people who were the brightest financial brains in the States and it didn't help them. Um, and in a way, that's perhaps because the numbers can lie if the culture of the organisation is not one of truth. And ultimately, no amount of numbers and people vetting numbers can change that. So in terms of committees, don't just slavishly follow what everyone else is doing. Think long and hard about the committees you need. Don't have just compliance committees. Don't have just audit and risk or audit, you know, and finance and then a separate risk committee and then, you know, think about the committees you need and think about whether they need to be standing committees of the board or they need to be just task forces that convene for a while, do a job and then disperse. Really think about it and make sure the terms of reference for any standing committees are very clear.
so you don't have committees running off doing what they want to do without reference to the board. So committees are very important. What this will mean, getting the right skills and the right structures sometimes, is you need to amend or change your constitution or your rules. And that requires a bit of effort, but don't take the attitude, oh, it's in our constitution rules, so we can't change it. Work out what you need for your organisation right now, and then go to the bother of changing your constituent documents if you need to. So another way that board members can increase their skills is by a very good induction for a new board member. Most organisations don't induct well. I know myself when I've joined boards, it's hi Kate, how are you? Great that you've joined the board. Here are the minutes of the last 12 board meetings, if you've got any questions. come. But an induction needs to be some decent meetings absorbing information over um, a, a longer period of time. Um, also, I find management update sessions are great for the board, getting some executives or senior staff in to say, this is what's happening in my area and here are the things that keep me awake at night and if I was you, this is what you I'd be asking me, so here's some good information. These are not sessions for the board to tell managers what to do, because that's the CEO, general manager's role. Rather, these are director or board member development sessions. It's for their information. Expert reports that come in about your sector or industry can be distributed to the board. Or you can call one in to run a session, development session for the board itself. All very useful. I think another thing that helps board members and boards get better in relation to skills is the introduction of a decent board and board member performance evaluation process. And even if that's only scheduling some time at a board meeting once a year to say, what have we done well this year? What haven't we? You know, what could we do better? And then writing yourself an action plan for the next 12 months to attend to the things that you think you can get better at. In fact, you can use this particular DVD as that sort of prompt because you can have a discussion about having learnt some of these things, what could we do that's a bit different and would make us better? The issue of individual board member evaluation is always a tricky one. But, you know, good boards, I think, do get to a point where at least the chairman sits down with each board member each year and says, here, this is how I feel you're going and let's just work out what you could do to improve performance. Another thing I said at the start is really important for the board to work with the right sort of behaviours. A young woman, Shay Newitt, in Australia did some research which looked at board effectiveness and actually correlated factors about boards with financial performance. And to cut a long story short, what she found is really only two things matter if you want a very good board. Firstly, how much the board members know about the organisation and its industry. And secondly, and divine that she said this, what the working relationships are like between board members and between the board and the CEO or general manager. Relationships are critical. I've seen boards, I promise you, comprised of the smartest people and, and the board is completely hopeless because it's totally dysfunctional. And I'm not going to abuse any particular um, field of expertise here, but I have in my mind some particular sectors where people have certain degrees where you put them together around a board table and it's a disaster. So behaviour is really important, or both of these factors are important. I think Shay's diagram here is interesting. She says if you've got a board where they don't know much, and they don't work well together, it's purely decorative. It's not going to achieve anything. If you've got a board where they love each other, but they don't know anything, it has to be a very trusting board because the real decisions are going to occur at management level. If you've got a board where the people know heaps, but they're jerks, they don't get on well, then you've got a restricted board because these people could add a lot, but they don't because basically they don't get on with anyone. And really what you want to is to have a potent board and therefore you've got to think about the areas you have to work there. In terms of relationships, the most important relationship is the relationship between the chair and the general manager CEO. They say in governance terms this should be a relationship of public 
um, support and private frankness. So if you see a chair and a general manager, CEO fighting all the time, there's big trouble. Somebody has to go. Also, the board has to do quite a bit of work on its own behaviour and the level of teamwork. That's equally as important as the other stuff it does. And often boards do this by developing what I call a living code of conduct. Not a code of conduct that sounds like the Corporations Act or the Incorporated Associations Act or some piece of legislation. A code of conduct written in plain English that says, this is how we're going to behave as board members. And the third thing. Uh, that relates to, to good governance is that the board must adopt very good practices. So to introduce some effective practices is important. What good boards do here is they'll have a calendar, not just of their meetings, but of actually known agenda items for specific meetings through a year. They'll plan that beforehand for an orderly progression through the year. They also make sure that the board members receive papers sufficiently before the meeting to be able to prepare. Once upon a time they used to say a week, now I think three days or so, because it can be hard for management to get papers out before that time. Then the board will discuss, as I said I think previously, what it wants the papers to be like. Are they clear? Are they concise? Are they sufficiently precise? Do they follow some sort of formula that makes it easier for the board to read them? These are important uh, issues to discuss. How long the meeting runs for? Two hours, three hours. The average board meeting now in Australia would run for about four hours. Some of you I know will die when you think we meet at 5.30 at night and we only want to run for two hours. Well, if that's the case, you need to think about how to make the agenda work for you. Um, what your minutes are like. Minutes are a skill and who takes your minutes and how they read important. They shouldn't be absolutely detailed. They shouldn't also be too brief. They must be a halfway house recording the major things discussed and of course the resolutions. And they should include an action list that's separated for things that have to happen coming out of that meeting so that those things can be revisited at the next meeting to make sure those things have happened. And the board should receive the minutes, not at the next board meeting, but within five days or a week of the meeting that the minutes relate to because then me your memory's fresh and you've got a chance of actually uh, recognising that things aren't perhaps as you remembered them and making changes. So effective process is really important for boards. And as I said, when we were talking general governance, there are really these things that you need to remember as a board. First of all, do you understand the role of the board? I'm hoping you do a little bit little better now. How are you looking in terms of the skill set and the behaviours around your board table? And are there things you need to do to introduce effective processes? Those three things are most important. And I know that if you consider where you may be able to improve, judging that against the information we've had a look at today, that you will develop a great governance plan for the next 12 months for your board and then slowly introduce it. You can't do everything at once, but good luck with that. I wish you all the best.